The following interview was conducted with Bruce A. McKenzie, Professor Emeritus in Agricultural and Biological Engineering, formerly known as uh, Agricultural Engineering, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 7, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History of Bern. Good afternoon, Professor McKenzie, and thank Good you afternoon. very much. Let's start off, tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born in LaGrange County, actually. Uh, the farm home is uh, three miles from Michigan, 20 miles from Ohio, way up in the northeast corner. It's in the northeast corner of LaGrange County. Uh, anybody who knows Shipshawana is the southwest sort of uh, part of the county. Uh, and I happen to be the seventh of 13 children. There were seven girls and six boys, and I'm the middle one of that group. So uh, uh, father was Nathan McKenzie, mother was, uh, would have been Marion Blanche Troxel was her family name, and in fact, uh, anybody who goes up in that area nowadays and knows that there's a... Uh, um, on Department of Natural Resources development all through that northeast Indiana area that follows the Pigeon River. Uh, that includes my mother's uh, family homestead. It's a part of that land holding. Now that's, that strings out over a distance of probably 20, 25 miles of, uh, of the river that is uh, in that project. So. Uh, I grew up in a large family, a family where we had the ball team, so everybody came to our house to play, and we had seven girls, so that brought a lot of guys in, whether they liked ball, softball or not. Um, didn't have very much money. Uh, what, did this your, was, what did your parents do? The, they they farm? were farmers. Okay. They, okay. they were farmers. We okay. were farming. At that time, uh, would have been farming 240 acres, which would actually be a fairly large farm operation. We owned 120 of that, and another 140 of, uh, of that was in uh, another family member owned it, but we farmed it as, uh, as a total of actually 260 in total. Um, and uh, to some degree, we used the family that we had in that nobody had any money, but somebody ate pickles all during the... Depression years and pickles. We had a pickle patch, a pickle acreage of something would range all the way from three or four acres to maybe as many as seven acres, and we really were using our own stoop labor to uh, to uh, maintain and, and manage those pickles till they got up to production, and then to pick them and harvest them and haul them into Howe, Indiana, which is the mailing address for the area. Uh, where they were accumulated and then were uh, ultimately moved. They were held in salt vats there, fairly large salt vats. See, I'm talking about something that, that looks like uh, a, a silo, basically, only it's only about 10, 12 feet high, but it's about 12 to 14 feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. And they actually set those up on the rail siding and accumulated pickles during the summer, and then in the fall they hauled them out of there as, as pickles that were in brine, and were hauling them basically into the Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan area where they where the processor was. So sure. those were those were contract production. That is to say, we had a we had a contract to produce pickles for an organization, but uh, that bought our school shoes. Our clothes, our books, uh, it was given us cash. And cash was something that we didn't have any, but nobody else did either. So it was uh, just a part of the, uh, you know, I'm talking about the Depression years. I was born in 1927, right. and uh, the period I'm describing now is in the, in the mid-1930s. <laughs> that is a carryover, basically, of, sure. the, of the 1929 Depression years. Right. And... Uh, was school, what was day, uh, grade school like? Was that close to where you all go? Um, we actually had a consolidated school. We had 12 grades in that consolidated school, oh. and that would have been about uh, 12 to 16 students per class. So it actually was a pretty big country grade school and high school, all in one. It was no... no no, um, it was a primary and a, and a middle school and a high school all done in one composite. Had her own gymnasium, had her own basketball team, played, they, they, 
they competed in baseball, in basketball, in volleyball. At that time, they had men's volleyball quite frequently. Um, and uh, so it... Uh, quite uh, active. It was quite an active. Sure. It, was, uh, it was a good country school. Uh, right. I, you know, I have, I have people my same age. I'm 83 as I speak here. But I have people my same age that grew up in, in, in a one-school, country school system, even in Indiana. There were lots of those in Nebraska at that time, but there weren't very many. Mm-hmm. In, there were none in northern Indiana, so far as I know, but there were quite a number, apparently, in southern Indiana, in some of the hill country, uh, a little country high school or a little country grade school, one-room school, sure. uh, would not have been unusual at all. But it was very unusual in that general community. In fact, I would say all of Stavannah LaGrange... Uh, Elkhart County, all of those, I don't think there would have been hardly any one-room schools in all of that territory. So Interesting. the school consolidation had, uh, had brought that, that together. Sure. Yeah. After, uh, then after high school, then what came next? Well, after high school, I, I left uh, high school in the middle of my senior year. I had enough grades to graduate, and I wanted to get into the Navy. This is World War II now. I'm okay. I'm headed for graduation in uh, May of 1945, but I went into the Navy in February of 1945. Before I was old enough, uh, I had actually enlisted before my 18th birthday, which would have been January 28th of that year, 1945. Uh Uh, I enlisted so that I could get in the Navy. I had two brothers in the Navy and two brother-in-laws, and several of their friends right there in that community that were all in um, the service at that time. Of course, Pearl Harbor was 1941, uh, and I'm going in in 1945. So they are the beginning of World War II, and I'm the, I'm the sort of tail end. Uh, I was in the only class that came out of Brighton High School at that time that had any advanced math. They had a good teaching program, uh, but uh, the the advanced math that you would use in a science or an engineering curriculum wasn't um, uh, wasn't a part because they just didn't have enough students to do that. We talked one of the girls into joining four of the guys who knew they probably would wind up in the service to get an advanced math, and that was an advanced algebra and um, would have been uh, solid geometry. Uh, as a, as an event, and that turned out to be an excellent investment. That oh, yeah. helped me indirectly in the service. Uh, it helped me in terms of uh, people forget that education is a discipline, uh, and and uh, so even though I wound up because I was late in the World War II time period in most of the sort of mechanic arts and and uh, and engineering sorts of things, they didn't really need in 1945. Uh, I wound up in a communication section uh, going to radio school, really. But the education in general helped me, but it helped me when I came to Purdue. Uh, And I came to Purdue because of the GI Bill, you know. Uh, I was in the service from uh, February of 1945 in the Navy uh, through uh, July of 1946, and I started in Purdue in September wow. of 1946. Uh, and most of the guys that were in class with me were four years older than I was because they had gone in in 41 or 42, some of them even 39. Sure. Uh, and uh, so they already, uh, they already many, most of them had been overseas. Many of them had been heavily involved in combat. And I never did any of that. I was basically a dry land sailor that was um, ultimately wound up. I, I wound up in a communication unit in California, but I spent uh, an inter- interim middle period of that basically working as a yeoman, which was as a secretary, uh, because I had typing skills. I had had typing also in high school, and most of the guys, even in my uh, communication classes had not had typing at that time, so we had actually a pretty good preparation out of the out right. of the process. Right. I had a brother that was in Purdue at that time in agricultural economics, uh, who had been uh, injured and uh, in following up on uh, the D-Day invasion. He was in the D-Day invasion. I think on Omaha Beach, but had gone back to England and had uh, 
uh, suffered an injury. He was a uh, he was a motor machinist in the Navy, which would be a, a diesel mechanic, uh, and he was a diesel mechanic on an LCT, which was a landing craft tank. That's uh, about a hundred and a hundred foot long Higgins boat out of uh, New Orleans. That, um, but John was in here uh, in Ag Econ, and he said to me, "Why don't you come down to Purdue and?" And look at ag engineering. It looks like a good curriculum. Looks like a curriculum, and I think you might do very well at. And that's basically how I wound I wound up at Purdue. Okay. I came down and talked to George Spencer, who was the who was a sort of a fatherly type figure that was uh, helping a lot of GIs kind of get into the flow of things. And I started into Purdue in September of '46. Except I did that at Elkhart High School. Uh, the only year that Purdue ran an extension center at Elkhart High School was that year. Uh, and they did it because they didn't have enough capacity here on the campus to handle all of the influx of students. There were still a lot of GIs coming or making decisions and, and what, plus to go to school. Already there. Yes, right. a bunch of them were already here, sure. probably more than were still coming in. But the collective mix of it was that it was giving them an unusual uh, amount of students, particularly in engineering, and that was an engineering curriculum. At, uh, it was a freshman engineering curriculum and was, was based out of Elkhart High School. That was our facility. But it, it was actually quite an interesting experience because the math teacher was from Goshen College. The drafting instructor was from Miles Laboratory, which is um, uh, Elka Seltzer, and the chemistry prof was from uh, uh, Elka Seltzer or or Miles Laboratories. Sure. The English teacher was an English teacher in the, in the school system there in Elkhart High School, and there was probably was a psychology or something else uh, in in that mix. So it was. Uh, uh, oh, now, where did, did you commute back and forth? Or I, I actually stayed. And we, we didn't have a dormitory, of course. Some of them stayed in the Y. I just rented a room in a, with a family there in the area, uh, and I had the breakfast privileges, really, in that, in that house. And oh, as wow. she gained confidence in me that I wasn't going to rip them off, uh, uh, she really extended the house, basically, sure. to me. And I used to visit with her. I, I, right now, I can't remember her name, but... But they were a good family, and and I had a bedroom, a front bedroom, which was right on the railroad tracks. But that didn't make any difference. Right. They were good people that had lived there all their lives, and and they just did that as a way to help a young guy and to gain a little bit of money themselves. Again, resources were still pretty limited sure. in this oh, yeah. process. I was going to school on ninety dollars a month, is what the, is what the GI Bill was paying for. But it was paying for all my books and my slide rule and. And all of the stuff that was involved, and it was adequate. You know, I could sure. I could live on ninety dollars oh, yeah. a month right. and do that very well. So and you were there for the whole year. I spent the whole year there, okay. and then transferred to the campus the fall of nineteen forty six. It would be the spring, yeah, the fall of nineteen forty six forty seven. I came to the campus, uh, and I still lived in private homes all the way through. Uh, all the there way through. There seemed to be a lot of people that were living. They people had. A, facilities within the homes. They either lived there or they rented them, rented out the rooms. Right? And, of course, at that time, you didn't have the kind of development that you have in West Lafayette in terms of the number of apartment houses. Right. You didn't have the number of dormitories. Cary Hall was the only dorm, the only men's dormitory that I remember at the time. Mm-hmm. I never really looked at it because I just, I, I didn't think I really wanted to go that way. Um, but there would not have been any of the high-rise dormitories, yeah. and none of even of the three-story ones uh, that came along in later years. Yeah. And there were a number of people that were living in private homes. There were not the number of apartment houses. There were not the number of uh, developed apartments. And the concept of uh, three or four guys going together or three or four guys and a gal going together and renting uh, an apartment that first off, most people probably wouldn't have rented to us on that kind of a basis, but there weren't very many apartments sure. geared to doing that. Right. The last year of my schooling, I then married. I married in September of 1943, I guess it would be. That doesn't sound right. 49. Yeah, of 40, the, yeah in 49, 
I, I married and my wife and I then lived in an apartment and a pretty grungy one uh, over in Lafayette. She was from Lafayette. Did you uh, meet her here then? I met her when I was here in town. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the first unit, the first living accommodation I had when I came on the campus, um, we had to go to housing and and get listings because housing availability was tight all wherever you went and i remember being in the being in the housing office over in the, in the, uh, the administration building uh, and they didn't have any singles available and there was another guy in there looking for a single also um, and he said to one or the other of us, uh, I, I do have an, a bedroom available in a home over in Lafayette that is, is designed for two guys. But, they have, but he said from the standpoint of Purdue's operation, you have to know one another to go in that kind of an arrangement. They weren't oh, going to put Oh, I love two, that. you got to know one another. Oh, yeah. Them. You weren't going to put two strangers in there together, <laughs> even though we've both been living in with strangers in the service. That wasn't any problem. And so That's we, got, we just got our heads together and said, well, we've known one another for a long time. You know, we're, we're sure we'll take that. And we wound up being over on actually just off from Casu Street, about probably three blocks from Columbia Park. And at that time, Columbia Park ran a dance program, of a public dance where young people could come in, and they always had a band, sure. had good bands. Sure. There were lots of good bands around at that time. Um, and I had taken some Arthur Murray lessons while I was in California in the service because I just had too much time on my hands, and so I... And I liked music, and I came from a family where everybody had danced as they had grown up through the years, and I had sort of gotten, I was the younger one of the World War II age group. I was, this, I would have been about 10 at the time they were doing all the dancing around over the Northeast Indiana area. Well, in any event, uh, I was sitting there one night listening to the music, and I had done that several times, just studying and listening to the music. Um, and one night I decided I'd walk over there. So I walked over and just went in, and they had a railing around the outside edge. And, they had and a people, building there where the dance Yeah, they had a building that okay. they were, the building is still there. Oh, I, think okay. it's, I think it's still a part okay. of their operation. <laughs> uh, and you could just sort of lean on the railing, and the people that weren't dancing were sort of outside the railing. And, but I just watched people dance, and I picked out a good one, and that turned out to be the... Irene, so I danced with her a time or two. I don't think I did probably the first night I went in there. I don't think I asked her sure. to dance. She was actually in there dancing with a cousin. There was a group of kids, as you did then, quite frequently. You just have a gang of kids who go over, okay. and they all they'd just dance back and forth with one another, and some of the gals would dance together, and, and it was a, it was was it a fun entertainment, night. music it was good, to do, right? It was good entertainment, sure. and, it was, and it was a fun group, and there wasn't any rowdyism, and there wasn't any... There wasn't any beer or anything involved in the process and out of that having done that then for some several weeks of uh, off and on uh, I made an acquaintance with her and that ultimately wound up to be the gal that I married and uh, she and I were together within 25 days of 60 years she passed away this last August oh, okay. but we were within 25 days of, of 60 Isn't years nice. Of, uh, of marriage, so we had a good time. Right. We danced all over the area here. We loved to dance. Super. We met at a dance, obviously. So we uh, we danced to uh, Lawrence Welk in Chicago at the Trianon. We did uh, we did uh, one of the, her favorite was Eddie Howard. We danced to him at the, at the one up at the lake here at the Monticello Lakes group. I can't think of the name of that facility, but we went up there and and did that round, and we just sort of partied around over there. And then after we married and got our first car, we lived in uh, brick apartments, which they would let us do at that time. Where, later. Would, they, where would they be the, located? Well, the brick apartments are the same ones that still exist up there right back of the football stadium, except they don't call them that now. But that, that group of, uh, of graduate student housing, or now graduate student faculty housing, was at that time supposedly was all graduate students, but they would let some faculty in there 
because again, the housing market was really tight. Yeah, and yeah, she and I good. lived in one of those brick apartments. It's right up the hill from Cary Hall. Okay. And you, what uh, do they call Hilltop? Well, I, I don't know what they're calling right. it. But what? they're near Ross Aid. Yeah, they're near Ross Aid. In fact, we could walk out of our apartment, do a button hook right around the front, and walk right into the stadium right. that was 150 right. feet away. Right. Uh, so it, it was a really convenient, and we lived in there probably two or so years. I had, I had completed... There was an apart it was an apartment, so you had cooking facilities? Oh, it was a complete apartment. Okay. It was an efficiency. It had a, it had a, um, a pull-out like sofa the, oh, that okay. made the bed. So sure. you, had to, you had to fold up the bed every, every morning <laughs> and fold it back out every night. Not every a night. bed, you know but what that, I mean? You know when I'm saying Murphy beds, you know what those are. Those are the ones that were in the closet. Yes. Once the closet and the bed came yeah. out. Yeah, no, right? this, one, this, was, this was a sofa I bed. <laughs> I this was a mean. sofa bed, uh, which you, of course, can still buy today. Oh, sure, yes, they're, sure. they're still standard. Yeah. But it was actually a very, it was a fun place for us. Everybody was about the same age. We were about the same age as graduate students, although I was on the faculty in agricultural engineering. I had graduated in August of 1950. Okay. Actually, on the 20th day of August, 1950, I graduated and I went did to work. Did they have a commencement? This is in August? Oh, yes. Oh, they did? Yes. Huh. Yes. And then I went to work for Purdue the day after I graduated. On the 21st day of August, I worked my first day on a job and I stayed 43 and a half years. Was that your, was in agricultural engineering. What was your first, where were you working then? Where'd I was start? working in agricultural engineering okay. as an instructor would have been the Right. The technical des designation at that time. Uh, I started as a, I started as an instructor and then went into an assistant professor. And at that time, you see, I had only a bachelor's degree, which was now again we're talking 1950, right. early 50s. That was not all that unusual at that time. Although there would have been a lot of people that would have had a master's degree and were a number that had PhDs at that time. Uh, but they could hire at many different kinds of levels, and I was in a highly applied uh, application program. I was in adult education, basically, as a technical resource or a technical specialist for farmers, agricultural producers, if you will, uh, for agribusiness types that were servicing farmers, and for rural families, because we were doing in agricultural engineering, uh, we were doing human housing as well as livestock buildings. And we were doing, we had a power machinery specialist, we had a soil and water specialist, we had a safety specialist, we had a farm structure specialist, and my area was basically a mechanization materials handling uh, specialist, um, and I basically was working at that time. Much of the emphasis was on um, wise and efficient application of electrical energy because uh, what the REMCs, the Rural Electric Membership mm -hmm. Corporations, which are the cooperative power suppliers of the state of Indiana, and the group that really put electricity in the rural countryside. Um, that had occurred actually um, in about the 1940, 41, 39 time period when the houses were being wired. Uh, our farm home in LaGrange County was wired basically um, in about 43, I think. There would have been a number of families that wouldn't have it at that time, but it was available to them. Wiring at that time involved uh, one light bulb in the middle of the ceiling of whatever room you had, and it involved maybe one outlet per wall if you were lucky. Uh, you know, it was pretty simple, but it was, uh, we, had, we had run in my own family with what are known as Aladdin lamps, which are antiques, but those are like gas lanterns, sure. except these are lamps that sit on an end table like a lamp around the house, which they were. Right. Uh, and they had a huge mantle on them, M -A -N, it's M-A-N-T-L-E, I believe, that, that is a, um, actually it's an asbestos uh, mesh material that somehow uh, uh, glows in that process and converts the, the fuel that the lamp is burning into a gas, and that makes a very bright light. This is not a pressure unit. This is not something you're pumping up. 
this is something that generates its own uh, high output, but those were good lamps. Actually, when Aladdin lamps came into the uh, process, we could see probably for the first time in our life, we had had oil lamps up sure. to that time. We had oil lanterns, which we still continue to use in the kitchen. My mother had an, she had a, a gas iron. Uh, in fact, she had two of those. That was an iron that you pumped up the pressure. That was a white gas, gas fired. It had a little, it had a little, everybody would understand a little Munson burner, but it actually had a little gas burner. Okay. And that was a unit that actually had a loop in the flow stream of the gas that was actually in the flame. And so that heated that loop and you put liquid from the pressure, the liquid flowed into one end and the, and the heat converted it to gas and it to a gaseous state and it spurted out the opposite end and run the burner. So when she got a gas iron, that was a huge, huge, up to that time, she had done her ironing by the old fashioned uh, irons that you put on the wood stove. We were still running with wood Those stove. really flat iron things. Yeah, flat iron things. The antiques that people see. Oh, you know, yeah, they right, were, grab them, right. They were a part of our everyday life. That's interesting. You, uh, you grab it off the stove, rub it on an old piece of towel to get make sure there isn't any grease from the eggs you fried that morning, and then you iron whatever <laughs> shirt or clothing or whatever was involved. So, uh, Let me stop you for one second right. before we go further. That Elkhart High School, I know this is where we're at, but I just for researchers, I'm thinking, how long did that program, did, was that just Just one, one year. Oh, it's the only just, year that Purdue ran that extension center. Now, they had some other extension centers. I don't know whether they were running at that time, but they ultimately had an extension center at Michigan City. Okay. And I think they might have, have had one at Jefferson. Would have been a precursor to what our I, region? I, yes, it would have been a precursor, okay. yes. I taught in the program after I was on the faculty here. I did okay. quite a lot of work with 4-H as, again, the technical specialist in the electric program and some of the mechanical programs okay. in the 4-H thing. And we would teach in the unit in, in Michigan City. Sure. That was in a building that was owned by the man Barker, who was the, who was the, the Barker that built the, uh, the um, uh, coaches for railroads. Uh, so that was a that was a mansion. I used to love to go up there because I spent all this my was his spare home time. And you'd have the oh yes, his home. this is a home that had a ballroom on the third floor that was uh, as big as most of the houses that anybody ever grew up in. You know, they were they were a, they were a family that had many means, had very very good financial uh, situation that came from his industry in. Uh, uh, in the railroad car business, so that was. But I don't know how many other Purdue centers there would have been. They Purdue ran a joint program with Valparaiso at one time. I think ran a joint program with maybe Tri-State. It was then. It's not Tri-State now. Oh, it changed uh, and at that time, Valpo was running an engineering program, and I don't believe they do now. But I'm not absolutely sure of that. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure, but Purdue might have had a joint program with Rose Poly, which is Terre Haute. Uh, Rose Holman, but I, again, I, I, you know, some of these things I haven't thought about for a number of years. But the extension centers were were um, augmenting the function of the university. IUPUI at Indianapolis and IUI Fort Wayne uh, were not uh, as nearly developed, and I'm not even sure might have even existed at that time. But they came along. Shortly yeah. after that, yeah. and in some pro, in some ways, Purdue was consolidating their efforts and learning from their experiences. The fact that Indiana never had a junior college system, and quite frankly, to some degree, Purdue and IU both discouraged that for a long, long period of time, um, meant that there really wasn't a development or, or a very vigorous development because that was competition for funding. Uh, in many of those areas, but ultimately the the need, the demand just overwhelmed the resistance and, and times out of change. that. Yes, times change. Right. And, right. and people made good decisions then and they made different decisions later. And right. we're still doing some of that. Right. And then, you know, both of us agree one of us is unnecessary. So so good disagreement is really healthy. A That's lot of right. people forget that, but it's, it's very important that we have a dialogue 
And it's not important that we agree, it's important that we understand right. how we each make. of us are in this polarity that we that, right. that seems yeah. to be so all important to each of our positions. Right. So well, go ahead and continue on some of the other things that you did. Yeah. Well, at that time then, I, I basically was starting as a young extension specialist. Um, and as I indicated, it was initially quite heavily involved in the application of really electrical energy technology to the rural countryside. That was involved in in uh, helping many homeowners with things that they were doing. Uh, they were, People were getting their first refrigerators, were getting their first uh, appliances. Uh, but particularly, we were looking at, um, um, at frost-free drinking fountains for livestock operations when you could get out of the business of having to go out and chop the ice out of the horse tank or out of the cattle tank. Uh, and have long periods of time when the animals couldn't drink. And so we had all kinds of fountain devices that developed and still exist to this day that, uh, that had small uh, electric heaters that were thermostatically controlled and were set over a hollow tile so that the pipe wouldn't freeze because the, the temperature coming out of the earth would keep the uh, temperature under the fountain. In later years, they insulated the fountain. They got smarter and they insulated the fountain so they didn't lose the heat once it got up to the top, uh, and we were doing, we were doing uh, a number of things in the materials handling way. We were struggling all the way through those years. We really were, fundamentally, we were making a transition from horsepower to tractor power, basically, to engine power. Uh, and, and I think back to that a number of times. I commented to somebody just the other day that, that we failed to realize. Uh, I grew up working behind horses as a 10-year-old. Um, I first started on a sulky plow, and I had three horses on there, and those horses each one weighed a ton. And this was a plow you ride on. That, to put a full-grown man on there now, and to add his weight to that load that they have to carry while they pull what is only a single plow, uh, which is just turning the soil upside down, basically, um, that was that was a burden for those horses, and so they put the kid on the sulky plow, and it was safer. I couldn't handle the walking plow that had two handles behind, the kind you see in Indonesia and other kinds, of, except theirs is even not really as developed in many instances as what we had. Theirs may be better adapted to their culture, but it's ours were actually pretty sophisticated, but it took a man to handle that kind of a plow, and we're plowing in land that has stones in it. So you'll hit a stone and the plow will pop right out on top of the ground and you've got to lug it back and back the team up. But, but that team of horses, they each weigh a ton and they develop a horsepower. You could put a one horsepower electric motor, I could hold it in my hands. And so in contrast, you're looking at, a, at an animal that produces one horsepower and weighs a ton and you're looking at an electric motor that might weigh 30, 40 pounds and produces one horsepower. And to a significant degree, that's the challenge that we were living. And we were in a time period when there was lots of job opportunity for everybody off the farm in a manufacturing operation, in a service agency. And so farmers were continually pressured to find ways to uh, mechanize what they had. And I was very much involved in that mechanization. Uh, I was helping show them how to convert big old uh, three-story barns or two-story barns, which were basically evaluated on their cubic content to barns that were becoming much more prevalent in the technology that I was uh, projecting and involved in, in monitoring and, and educating in that were based on measuring the square footage. You wanted, you wanted space. You didn't want a hay mile. Right. You, wanted, you wanted a shelter for a machinery storage, for a dairy holding area, for a hog house, for whatever. And then ultimately, uh, I did the bulk of my buildings area support work would have been in the materials handling and grain handling and grain drying and grain storage. And so at the same time that we were transitioning from horsepower to uh, engine power, if you will, tractor power, 
we were also then very shortly after that, this would have been in the um, early 1960s, late 1950s, we were in the process of transitioning from ear corn to shelled corn. Uh, the only ear corn that most young people ever see nowadays is the one you buy in the store for a squirrel in the backyard. But we had ear corn cribs on every farm, and all the corn was stored as ear corn. We never could keep the rodents out of it, so you always had, you always had rodents in it. Uh, so there were sanitation aspects that ultimately have, uh, today we wouldn't, we wouldn't accept it. We did then, you know, and, and it was washed before it was processed. Mm -hmm. Most of that corn was going into hogs right. and, and livestock, but there was always a percent going into human food, cereals and so forth, and into whiskey and other kinds of, of, uh, of products. But we were transitioning from an ear corn technology to a shell corn technology. And that, uh, I don't know what, the, well, a roasting ear is an ear of corn, okay. Uh, but it's non-free-flowing. So we're going from, from material that is really, really um, uh, quite demanding physically to handle. Um, it takes two and a half bushels of ear corn to give you one bushel of shelled corn. So you, you're handling two and a half times the volume of material. The material is non-free-flowing. Uh, and you have some restrictions in terms of how you can, uh, uh, how you can maintain it uh, in good quality, but particularly it's not yet in the form in which you want it, so you now have to shell it yet in the process, which at that time we were doing with the stationary sheller, or we were shelling it by hand, which we did some of both, and every farm had a hand crank sheller that the kids ran, ran the crank and fed the chickens and fed the hogs and so forth. Uh, that transition, however, I would have farmers, and now I am talking about probably the late 1950s and, and 60s and on into the early 1970s, when a farmer would say to me, when we'd convert him to shelled corn, he'd buy a field sheller. Initially, those were uh, ear corn harvesting devices with the sheller put on the back, and so you were really you were really running a corn picker, but dumping the output right directly into a sheller and shelling in the field. In a relatively short period of time, we came along with a combine adaptation that did the shelling right as the ear went into the intake of the machine and the shelled corn went into the holding tank and it's the one that people see in the fall and, and, uh, and just accept as being standard plays. But Farmers would come back to me after they would make the conversion to shelled corn, and they would make a statement, something along the lines of, of a comment that would say, you know, I never handled my corn crops so easy. I never, it's just so much easier to handle it on a fluidized basis, if you will, as a pellet, as a natural pellet, which God made it that way. Um, and I, I just never, I never, got through a corn harvest as easily as they do now. And the net upshot of that was that he real quick realized he could just add another 50 acres or 100 acres of production, and handling the output of that really wasn't that much of a problem. And out of that came a rather rapid increase in the size, and there, although there are disadvantages socially and economically, there are many, many advantages sure. also to that process. And we basically then revolutionized the, the field technology, the horsepower technology, and we revolutionized the primary product that we, that we harvest, the corn. And I was involved in the drying technology, the management of the grain. Um, nowadays, a 10,000 bushel bin would be a small bin. At that time, it was a big bin. Mm -hmm. And I used to kid my farm audiences because many times uh, uh, they wouldn't monitor that shelled corn in the bin as closely as they really should, and they'd have a spoilage problem develop. And I, I used to kid them that if I if I would hang a bucket in the top of an empty bin and I would put $10,001 bills, it was worth about a dollar a bushel at that time. If I put $10,001 bills in that bucket, they'd probably look in it every day. In fact, some of them probably would sit out there and watch it. They'd, they'd never leave it. 
but they would put 10,000 bushels of corn that is worth $10,000 and is a product that will grow if the environment, if you create moisture and heat in there, it'll sprout, uh, it'll, it'll grow. And, and they don't look at it maybe once a month. And that doesn't make any sense. So you can see the essence of the educational program. You're trying to get them to get the big decisions separated from the little decisions. The other general aspect of the area that I was involved with was long-range planning. Because we were growing so rapidly in this time period that we were overrunning the facilities that they already had. And the form of the facilities was changing. We were moving from ear corn to shelled corn. We had we had plans that would show you how to convert your, shelled, your ear corn crib to a shelled corn storage. Uh, but they weren't very good, really, because they would still be a wood structure, and they still had the rodent problem, and the bird problem, and the coon problem, and all the other stuff that, that can go with that uh, non-sealed container. And so the round metal bin, which ultimately has become sort of the hallmark of the countryside as you look at how we handle our corn crop, uh, that's basically what we were, what we were involved with, and I remember uh, it would have been along about in the 1958, 59, 60 period. I did my master's degree at Michigan State in from 57 to 58. So I took one year off, did a master's degree in one year, and came back, and that's as far as I ever went with my degree program, and that was in agricultural engineering at Michigan State which incidentally was closer to LaGrange County than was Purdue, but that's just kind of an interesting side issue. It just happened to work out. Yeah, it just happened to work out that way. But in that, in that time period, one of those falls, I remember experiencing at least a half a dozen farmers who were struggling with how they would re-engineer their grain facility to make it better meet their needs. Now we're talking about integrating the materials handling, the flow of materials so you can bring in a load and receive it, get it into a wet holding bin, get it from a wet holding bin into a dryer, get it from a dryer through the drying process, remove the moisture, get it over into a storage vessel, and then be able to manage that storage vessel and carry it through in good quality and then bring it back sometime that winter or maybe next spring or maybe not even into the summer, bring it back out of there and market it for whiskey or cornflakes or hog feed or whatever it may be. I had at least a half a dozen people that were saying, I, I, I need a better facility. And as I looked at what they had, if they had made the right decisions, they wouldn't have had the problem they had. <clears throat> so they were, <clears throat> they were very much a result of, if you will, poor planning. Not poor in the sense that they were stupid. It just was that the long-range plan wasn't good enough. Sure. And... I, I started then innovating and forcing myself to pull back from that and say, if you didn't have anything to start with, what would the ideal grain facility look like? And if you travel across the state of Indiana, even right now, you see all kinds of clusters of one, two, three, four grain bins or more around a vertical lift with gravity spouts down into the bins. Um, and that is what I would call a closed system. That is to say, that vertical lift in the middle, middle, which we call a bucket elevator, is a device that you bring in a load of grain, you dump it into the intake of that unit, which is flush with the ground, so he's got a hydraulic dump bed nowadays. Uh, so he dumps into that, it lifts it up, puts it over into the wet bin, it flows out through the dryer, comes back and goes back up the leg and goes over into the storage and flows back out of the storage and comes back to the center point and you can load it back out next spring. And that innovation ultimately became a core part of my program and it really was geared to long-range planning, trying to get them to extend their planning horizon. Um, I did that by... Uh, 
a number of sort of gimmicks. Um, Gypsy Rose Lee one time said, Gypsy Rose Lee, some might not even remember, was a striptease artist. And she always, she wore a rainstone in her tummy button. I never did that as, as part of my act, but, uh, but she said, you got to have a gimmick. The gimmick here was to try to get them to think of long range planning in a different way. And what I, what I would say to them is, you plan it like the best you think you can see you need. Maybe five years ahead. You might be able to visualize five years ahead. And then you double it. And in some instances, I would encourage them to double it yet again. So now you plan, you're planning horizon. You're trying to find an artificial way to force their planning horizon, force them to process a planning horizon that looks at what would happen if I was ever so foolish to buy two more bins that were twice as big as the two bins I have, where would I put them? Uh, and out of that then came a program, really. Uh, and uh, in my judgment, all educational systems ultimately become, if you make them effective, you get them into a program. And that program was to get them into a planning horizon that would recognize that the building lasts about three to four times as long as the technology for which it is designed. Uh, you just sort of overrun it in the process. It's true in hog buildings. It's not really true in the grain bin, but it is true in the supporting systems to the grain bin because the grain bin is modular. We put up nowadays 50,000 bushel and 75,000 bushel bins are not unusual at all. Uh, at that time, they would have been unheard of, except at a commercial elevator. Uh, but you are working on a modular system, and you can plan a horizon that will make room for those future modules and let you bring them into focus. That really became really the focus of the field program as a technical expert for the county extension staff. And that was working, I, I knew intuitively that if we could get to the people who were marketing this, these products and influence their planning so that they were presenting the concept that we were talking about, uh, now you're getting into the really heart and core of the Cooperative Extension Service, which is to help people help themselves. Yeah. And if we could get all of the bin dealers, quote, that are traveling the countryside here to talk in terms of concepts of planning for several more bins than what you have, which is will affect their pocketbook later, and, but it will also affect the, the farmer's performance. Uh, that's really the core uh, of, the, of the technology program. It took me a long time to realize that you really do this for the people. You, the technology is just the vehicle by which you get this stimulation from interacting with. I, I used to have people ask me, uh, how can you do the same program in, from January to March in those earlier years? We did our adult education sit-down programs where the county agent would arrange a meeting on grain storage or grain handling or whatever it might be. And it might involve agronomy and ag econ and ag engineering or ag and biological engineering now. Uh, and we would do, we would develop all facets of that. We had planned those programs together collectively, the three of us. Uh, and uh, we would present that program to them and we'd do that maybe three to four nights a week and sometimes would slip one in during the daytime. But so you might do you might do three, four, five of those sessions in a week, and we might do that three weeks out of four for a month and a half to two months of time period. And they would ask, how can you do that and not just get bored, if you will? But you don't. And the reason you don't is you got 50 people sitting out here who are interacting with you and need what you're doing. 
And uh, we used They're to... They're new faces each year. Yes, time. yes. And we used to kid <laughs> some of them. Cause, well, and some of them you'll see them again, time and again. Oh, sure. Because it takes a period of time before you... And some of them aren't ready in the first round. They are in a learning process. They're in a psychological process right. that is that is getting ready to make a change that is not cheap. It's not, a, you know, uh, even in the more modest time periods, uh, in the latter part of my career, a lot of these facilities we're talking about were 100000 to a quarter of a million dollars that were involved in the facility when it would be complete. And so it's not a casual uh, decision. But we used to kid some of them that they were slow learners because you see them back time and time and time again. But, uh, no, I had such a good time I came back. Yeah, yeah. I, I, listen, I enjoyed listening to you. <laughs> but we had, uh, we had lots, of, uh, lots of good times. I also did leadership in uh, then, in extension in general, both within <laughs> the department. I was the so-called project leader or coordinator of our extension specialists. And then I did some, um, some central uh, uh, leadership programs, one involving a fairly major reorganization of our specialist and, and, uh, and county staff people under the, at the request of and under the direction of the director. Uh, so I, that was sort of drawing from my experience sure. and, and one who had uh, fairly good people skills and, and fairly good uh, uh, concept of, uh, of, of an educational program based on sort of... Uh, the idea in extension all the way through is to, is to try to get the idea, to get you to accept the idea as being yours. It's not my program, it's, it becomes your program. And if I can get you to buy into that program... And and uh, and then talk about it with your neighbors. You become a teaching person in that community. And lots of these people we're working with are are leaders to start with. Uh, there's a, a thing they use in uh, how people adapt ideas that ranges from from uh, an early innovator over to a non-adopter with about five ranges in there. And a lot of the group we were working with in these early parts of these uh, successful changes were in the early parts of that bell curve that, that forms that uh, group. But uh, um, out of that uh, came some rather major changes. Yeah. To were the a lot of these were in those early days. Many of them were family farms. Oh yes, they would okay. have all. They would have almost all been all family farms. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, there would have been a few that were incorporated, and in the later years, some of them. But sure. they were still were family farms. Sure. But they were corporations. Right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those World War II guys. Um, a number of them were really, really good uh, business managers. Although many of them were not college graduates. But there was, uh, you know, uh, God gave you a certain amount of smarts to start with, sure. and some people use it better than others. Uh, and, and coming to Purdue or any university in the state of Indiana is a whale of a way to kind of whet some of those, right. uh, some of those uh, God-given talents and try to, to try to get a perspective and to get some skills that you can market, but it is an ongoing learning process. Right. Right. Some of these guys that came out of World War II and would have been, well, they maybe went in in 39, 40, 41, and they came out then as they would have been 25, maybe. Right. They didn't go to college. They went back into the home farm, and at that time, they could buy land maybe two hundred, four hundred, six hundred dollars an acre. But if they bought another two hundred acres this year, and compared it to the previous four or five that they had bought back the line at lower prices, when you averaged them all together, you just sort of rolled that that process forward. They were very good business managers. Some young people in those families do not realize that that in some instances, the children growing up from those same men are not as good a business managers as the, as the originals were. And sometimes dad put together an operation that really taxes the young guy to be able to manage at that level because he doesn't have the opportunity to grow into it over 20, Period 25 years. 
and maybe not quite the same motivation. So it's uh, there's a number kind of factors of, that yeah, come into play. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's a number of factors that that sort right. of impact aspects right. of that. And uh, I've asked this for other people, but during those days, that you had the winter farm courses. Did some and people were you involved in those? The we ag used to come. Did some here on campus, on but campus. most of those were done by resident. Okay. And and I I did. So some usually, they would be the the week in which the fish fry. Was yes. Big. Yes. And I, and I did I did some specialty sessions for okay. them. I might come in and do a three day unit on grain handling sure. for them. Okay. Uh, but I was not at that time was not classified uh, as on the teaching staff. I was on the extension staff. Now okay. later, I was both uh, carrying out the extension program as the as the mode of delivery reduced from as much hand holding and on site contact with them, done more remotely. Uh, then I went, I did some classroom teaching and they wanted me to do that because I had a fairly successful program out here that had a lot of significance to these. Okay. And so at one time I was teaching five sections of 30 students a section every semester. And that ran along for about three or four years that we had that scale and we had we had sort of run up to that level, and then we went back down uh, as we sort of got that technology out there and got it uh, sure, got uh, up in and process. Right. Yeah. right. Um, one thing I do want to ask you for the researchers, it used to be agricultural engineering, mm -hmm. and do you know the reason that it was changed in 95? Well, it's basically to make it more descriptive of okay. where it is. There are several ex aspects of that that impact that. Number one, it's always been biological engineering. The reality is that, that agricultural engineering was always working with biology. Uh, to put it in a simple form, ag engineering, I, I used to use this illustration with, with some young people particularly, but it's, it's one of the engineerings, and there aren't very many, where you can both manipulate the product and manipulate the, the hardware to make them fit. If the grapes don't fit the grape harvester that you're trying to design, you can redesign the grapes. And so you can go over and get the hort people and say, I'd like to have a grape that grows with a longer stem so that it'll hang down lower so I can bring my mower along and cut it off without cutting the top of the grapes off, the bunch of grapes. So you can manipulate the tomatoes for one-time harvesting. You can make all of the tomatoes come mature within let's say 90% of the productivity of that plant is mature within a three-day period, and you can just harvest the whole plant. You just sacrifice the plant, take them. So there's all kinds of aspects of, of that. I think there's probably some in mechanical, in the medical engineering, where you can manipulate the bug as well as the thing you're chasing the bug sure. with, and you may be able to make a, a, a thing happen that you want to happen but you're actually tweaking two technologies at the same time. That's not true in all engineering. You know, building washing machines and motors and a lot of that kind of stuff. It may not necessarily, uh, it may not necessarily uh, bear out. So the fact that we had been in the biological business all the way along, that was a part of it. We also had curriculum components that were building in the biological dimension. We had the joint program with biochemistry. So it was an agricultural and biochemistry, agricultural engineering and biochemistry yeah, right. Right. program. We had a food engineering program, which is very much involved now in the biology of the food as well as the processing. And when you think food engineering, you know, ultimately we're still trying to find a way to make hospital food interesting. Uh, and, and some of that can be done. Engineering can have a very significant impact on the flavors and maintaining the flavors, maintaining the textures, being able to handle it, the, the work uh, that's been done on uh, the sealed containers for tomato juice that... Uh, Dr. Uh, Phil Nelson. Yes, that Phil Nelson did. You know, right. there's, there's a lot of mechanical aspects of a lot of these kinds of things. So that's a part of it. We, all, we then did have a component of our student body that agriculture as a word wasn't a good descriptor. They were food engineers and they were biochemical and agricultural engineering majors. And they didn't really like, they considered the word agriculture to be a stigma. 
Um, sort of tugging on the other side of that equation, however, is the fact that we have a whole clientele group clear across the whole countryside who are keyed to the word agriculture. They are agriculture. Rural Indiana and families are basically oriented. They don't think biological aspect of the business. So we were trying to, to, yes, to amalgamate all of those different uh, views. And, and we really came down to a pretty tight struggle, whether it was biological and agricultural or whether it was agricultural and biological. You could do A before B. You, people, yes. Some people won't buy into that. Yeah, group, right? but, but ultimately the group that really felt we had to maintain our base of people who identified with the agriculture that had always been a part of it, that needed to remain a core part. And, and But we could get the biological in there and then could help the people. That, because many of, some of these kids were going into job situations and they were looking at a, a food engineering specialty in their training and they were, but they had a degree in agricultural engineering. And that, that wasn't Many of the people doing the interviewing on behalf of the company wouldn't accept that transposition and the kids were not capable at that age of really selling it. So it was a logical transition, a logical move, and it's been a good move. It's, uh, right. you, 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 people would be amazed at some of the people. I'm amazed as one who grew up in the traditional sort of agricultural side of the operation to look at the backgrounds of some of the people that are on our faculty. Of course, we've had some chem engineers on our faculty for several years, sure. probably 20 or 25, right. uh, because they had specialties that we needed. And so In that department, right. Yeah. Um, I, we talk, I mentioned earlier um, that plaque. Talk about the plaque that uh, the American Society of Agriculture to, to designate aeration as a historic landmark, and you said you knew these two gentlemen, Foster and Robinson. Foster and Robinson were... They were here when you came? They were here, both. Uh, yeah, Robinson was a graduate student, and George Foster I worked with, he was a researcher, but a very much a, um, a very well-grounded theoretical researcher with a lot of hands-on kind of of uh, application stuff along with that. And that, that technology that they innovated along with several other people, there were a cadre of about four or six individuals in the U.S. who developed the so-called aeration technology. And aeration in this sense is uh, a process of moving uh, air through grain as a mode of, uh, or as a way of uh, maintaining its condition by manipulating the air conditions and or the frequency which you use or the manner in which you use those air movements, you can control and manage um, that mass of grain and keep it in condition, uh, you know. Uh, so that was the basis for that. That plan. It's it revolutionized uh, grain storage. It made shelled corn and shelled grain bulk storage uh, of of uh, natural grain pellets. Um, it made it possible on a U.S. and international basis. We, we applied some of it to coffee in Brazil. George was involved very much. George Foster was involved oh, the in Purdue, that process. Oh, the Purdue project? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Purdue had the project in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometime ought to bring somebody in who would have some background. I've got, I picked up some bit, bit, people who've been a little bit involved. In okay. A little bit. Are both these people still alive? Robin, no, I don't think either one of them. I know George Foster is dead, and okay. I think... Uh, Bob Robinson, I haven't had contact with him in uh, in years, but yeah. I that's he very went back that's to very Ohio. nice. That's a real yeah. land thing. Yeah. Um, the um, were you involved at all in the breaking new ground? 
No, that has been that has it's, been, and in, I was involved in bringing Bill Field into our okay, program because I did and, interview and, Professor Field, and, and I just wondered if you had yeah. any connection with that. Uh -huh. Well, I I know the program, and in fact, he he adapt, he was he was the we brought him in as a safety specialist, okay. and then he innovated the breaking new ground out of out sure of that. that program, but he picked up a program that I had been carrying on uh, that I had developed on safety in working around flowing grain because flowing grain is very dangerous. If you, if you, if a farmer walks into a grain bin and there's a cone of withdrawal being drawn out of that bin, it'll suck him right into the grain and cover him and, That's it. and he's gone. You can't get him out. You can't, a child, you can't pull him out. You pull her shoes off. You pull her arms off trying to pull him out, uh, the, the frictional drag on their bodies. And Bill took that program and carried it on and, and well, made nice. it a part. Oh, yeah. Good. The, the cooperative character of the people in agriculture, and particularly the people in agriculture at Purdue, I would say that our, our ability to innovate programs that were interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary in the sense of involving ag econ and agronomy and ag engineering and vet science, whatever the mix might be that we needed, that cooperative level at Purdue has always been superior to almost anything that I knew. I, I have a I had a national audience that, that knew me and knew the program I was involved in, and I traveled and did some extension to some of them. And, and I would say that our ability here to, um, to have the freedom to innovate those joint programs, because these are, these are in the open space between two departments. Right, right. And people forget that, that cooperation frequently isn't 50-50. Cooperation may be 10 and 90, but if you got to do 10 to get 90 or 90 to do 10, so be it. But if it's good for the people of Indiana, and that was sort of, and you, you have to credit administration. You have to credit the extension directors and the deans of agriculture that have cultivated this climate to keep that interdisciplinary. In later years, it has worked more effectively now through interaction with engineering. We needed more interaction with engineering in some of the problems we were facing in the rural countryside. I used to work occasionally with a little rural manufacturer that was running out of an old chicken house. Now, an old chicken house down in southern Indiana might be 500 feet long and 30 feet wide and you know, probably not high enough to run very much equipment in, but, but they were working. But they had plant layout problems, and they had the engineering design problems, and, and we never could quite get that fluidity uh, at that time working with engineering. But through biomedical engineering and interdisciplinary engineering, and then through agriculture and biologicals, uh, food engineering programs, and... and uh, as the as the mathematical side and the computer right. side, ag engineering has always had here a very very strong leadership in the computer system, the computer technology, and and that grew up after I came on the faculty. Those are people that came in after me, in, in Larry Huggins and in a whole bunch of people, Jerry Isaacs, that were that had excellent expertise among themselves, and then cultivated programs and funding and graduate students that totally use right. these technologies, and, right. and it's done very well by them. Yeah, that's good. Let's talk about a couple of your awards. Uh, the Frederick L. Hovde Award. Well, again, that's, you know, that's, that's one of nice. the, it's sort of, it, it, it's, yeah. Very nice. I, I remember uh, reading one of your other people made the comment, if you live long enough, some of these things happen to you, you know. There were a lot of people in Indiana who knew me. I, I'm a rather gregarious person, and, and I, I enjoyed tremendously the people that I interacted with, and I could interact with them comfortably at virtually all levels, almost from CEO right on down to the lowest guy working out here in a job. didn't make any difference to me. I, I had a job to do, and, and all of those people were a part of my audience, if you will. Uh, and so that became recognition on the part of, uh, it's, a, it's a, 
uh, an award that comes through Farm Bureau's group. They find and it. there's lots of those people who knew me and knew my interaction with the grain producers and livestock producers of the state. And we had a number of other specialists sure. doing parts of all of these pieces. But that's the, that's, that's nice. It, it's, it's nice it's to be recognized. Yes, it is. Right. It is. It, it makes you feel good. Any other awards that you... Well, I've, I've gotten several. Uh, the, a career award in extension. I okay. did a, I got a USDA award at the time. Earl Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, that was, uh, that actually, I believe that one was uh, related to energy. I, Super. Uh, I coordinated, uh, uh, co-coordinated with Otto Doring in Ag Econ, who's... Uh, a guy you ought to interview at some point in time. Okay. Uh, he's a really, really neat individual, very, very capable person. And uh, uh, Otto and I did quite a lot of the, of the um, sort of energy in the countryside kind of thing. When everybody thought they were going to make a beer still out in their backyard and make enough alcohol to run their car in the mid-1970s, uh, and it turns out that if you run that beer still, you got to run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you soon figures out that that probably isn't going to work very well. Uh, so, uh, so some some of those kinds of things uh, they they happen and uh, they make you feel good, and and you appreciate them. But they do involve a whole lot of people. They involve your family, they involve your colleagues. Uh, you just have a lot of people that you. Purdue was just a whale of a trip for me. I, I've enjoyed it. I couldn't imagine. And I'll, I'll reemphasize, I think a lot of people do not realize that, a lot of young people don't realize that working can be fun, it can be exciting, it can be a, a neat job. You get an education. Purdue had a program at one time, I don't know if they still do this, Purdue Agriculture, called Professor in the Classroom. But I, I did a part of one of those units. I just, now this is towards the end of my career. I'm in the last five years probably of my 43 plus years that I was on the faculty. Uh, but I was talking to high school kids and one of the things that I emphasize to them is that you really get the education not for the money. You get the education to work at a job that you enjoy, to have an opportunity to bid competitively for a job that you enjoy. If you enjoy it, you'll probably do it well. And if you do it well, somebody will recognize you for it. Well, no. And if they don't recognize it, your education, if you've done it well, will make you so you can do it as well as anybody else. But you can say, but I'm not going to do this for 40 years. I'm not going to work for this person, or I'm not going to work in this subject matter. I have an education that I can put out here and market. I can market myself. And ultimately, I think what you really ideally would like as a young couple coming up in the system, you'd like to find a job that you enjoyed that had a little bundle of fun money up here at the top that you don't have to buy diapers and tires and fuel and pay house payments, that you got a little fun money that you can take your wife out to dinner or take your family on a vacation. And, and if you can get that done, to be a basketball coach that gets three or four or five million dollars, I'm not sure that that's happiness for... I, I, I don't think some of them are probably that happy. I hope they are, but I don't think they probably. But I think there's lots of people can be happy with a good education, and a Purdue education is a whale of an investment. Right. It's a whale of an investment. What are you doing in, in closing? Just what are you doing in your re been since you retired? I, I did for the first five years. I was a CASA, court-appointed special advocate for children. I enjoyed that tremendously. Okay. Uh, and and you're, uh, you know, that involved writing, which I like to do. Uh, and it involved people, which I liked and enjoyed. And children do not have many advocates. Uh, a child in a family that really doesn't give a damn, quite frankly, has a pretty hard time finding somebody that'll speak up for their needs. And then there's a number of children in families that are trying hard and but struggling that can gain help. I think it's a very good program. I was some disappointed through the years. I told them when I started I didn't want any sexual abuse cases and I didn't want any 
drug cases. And unfortunately, if I were starting in the day, that probably is the preponderance of the situations where you really have problems. But, but it was a case of advocating for children in the court, making recommendations on the kinds of services that the community may be able to bring to bear to help this child in the circumstances. Probably that's, hopefully, that's back in their home with their biological parents. May tr reduce, try to do some retraining on their parents. Some of them probably aren't trainable. But many of them are trainable and are redundant. Beyond that, I helped with the barn at Museum of Prophetstown and helped bring that about. I spent about a two year period of time out there and some of that overlapped. We took two barns and made one and, and picked out barns in the state of Indiana and I knew something about barns. I didn't know structurally, but I knew functionally sure, what we were sure. after. Uh, then my wife had a 10 year Parkinson process and ultimately it came to a point where I really needed to give her the support she needed sure. and, and uh, uh, her life the last several years. She died in August of 09. Uh, as I indicated, within 25 days of 60 years, we had a we had a ball. We had a good time, and life had gotten to where her quality of life, quite frankly, wasn't all that great. I have two children in Indianapolis that are raising families, and I interact with, and I still have. There are seven of the original Mackenzies still alive. I traveled this last month, 4,000 miles. I drove with my 86-year-old sister, and she and I did a run to Florida of 4,000 miles, went down through Little Rock, Arkansas, because we wanted to go to Heifers International, which is a giving program for the people who give animals to disadvantaged people, making a dollar a year or a dollar a day sure. or a dollar a week somewhere in some disadvantaged country, just, I think, a super program. We went on down to New Orleans and looked at the World War II Museum and the Higgins boats, which my brother was on. And then we spent two weeks at her, she has a villa at Seaburn, Florida, we did that. We just did, we spent more time together than we probably had spent any time since we were in our <laughs> teens. She and I, and my middle brother who's deceased, between us, uh, the three of us washed dishes for this large family group. We sat down at the table for 12 to 13 of us for probably at least a 10 year period of time. Uh, the whole table, mom and dad, and there would have been, the, the, the 13 children spanned 18 years, so they're pretty tight. Uh, but you have some that are out of the nest before the last ones come in. Um, but it was a fun experience. I still laugh every time I think about my wife. The first time I took her up there, when she and I first were going together, took her up there to get her friend with the family, and she watched mother make <laughs> coleslaw in a dish pan in a great big granite dish pan, the likes of which most of the mothers of the people we talk to nowadays never saw one. <laughs> they don't even have one. It's the size of a big roaster. Oh, sure, right. Yeah, and it thing. was just heaped up with coleslaw out of cabbage we grew in the garden. She was shredding it and making it. And I already was thinking, my God, who's going to eat all that, all that cabbage? But we ate it, you know, we ate good. We didn't have any money, but we ate good. Right. Had a loving, caring family relationship. A lot of us got education. Most of us got education. Not all college graduates, but a number of associates. And uh, uh, several are Purdue. Several are IU. We have lots of IU, Purdue fun. Uh, just Sounds a good. great, great, great family experience, as has been Purdue. It's just right. great. I want to thank you. What a great conversation. You okay. just really enriched it all, and my pleasure. Thank well, you very much. Thank you it's for nice. having me. There was a family that lived not too far from us when I was I was born and raised in the suburbs of Cleveland. They had 13 children. The youngest was a girl, and the oldest, and everybody else in there was... Oh, were all boys. We were all boys. Ah. Yeah. Yep. Now, Peggy mother was, was always was quite fortunate. Right. That's interesting, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah.